Hi everyone, welcome back to English 200. Today we're going to be discussing the short story by Meili Chai called Saving Suri. It's a story about the relationship between two refugee Cambodian young women and the way that their relationship is challenged and changes over time. In some ways, it's the story of any sibling relationship. So maybe you really relate to this aspect of the story's you know, intense description of their bond and the way that growing up in some ways severs aspects of that bond. I think what's really kind of impressive about this short story is it calls out to us you know, as general readers, whatever your background or experience is, you might be able to find some way of understanding the intensity of family bonds here. At the same time, it's also very specifically about the refugee and immigrant experience. And so we need to keep these two things in mind at the same time, the kind of universal message of it, the universal appeal to it, and the specific cultural aspect of it, because this is an important thing that we want to think about in this class. I want to remind you of a few key terms before we jump into analysis of the story. The, the first term I want us to keep in mind is dynamic. So dynamic characters are characters that change over time and we witness the way that they change through the course of the story. Static characters are the opposite. They more or less stay the same. They don't undergo some great transformation either, you know, literally or in some kind of, um, say, emotional existential way. The other dichotomy that I want us to keep in mind is round and flat characters. When authors write stories, they think about whether their characters are going to be given a lot of dimension and whether we get a lot of interiority and we understand their subjectivity. This makes them round characters, they're fleshed out versus flat characters, which, well, are precisely that. They're kind of two-dimensional. In some ways, a, a flat character is maybe a stereotype or an archetype. Now, you might think, well, why would a good writer write a flat character? Isn't that just lazy? Perhaps, but I think often when characters are written intentionally as flat characters, it's because it allows us to kind of put them, put them to work in a particular way that reveals other aspects of the story or other relationships that the characters have that would not be possible if every character in the story was flat or round. So let me kind of map this for you. You know, we'll want to ask, is Nia a dynamic character or is she a static character? Is Sorty a dynamic or static character? What about the men in the story? Is Duke a flat character or Mr. Chai a flat character? I would submit to you that yes, they are flat characters. We don't get a lot of interiority from them. They're sort of just there in the background. And I think that that's really interesting because this is a story about the relationship between primarily two sisters, but also their relationship with their mother. So this is a very kind of women-centered story, isn't it? And we have the absent father who we know has died in Cambodia. And then we have these men who are just sort of there. And the decentering of the male characters allows us to really focus on female relationships that, you know, in many cases aren't usually the subject of works of literature. So the fact that this story, which was written in 2001, gives us that angle is really important. Finally, I want you to think about the term foil. Foil, as you read from the key terms, refers to characters that are sort of opposites of each other. Um, they might be oppositional in some kind of conflict, but not necessarily. They could also be and well, in the case of Saving Sorty, we could think of Sorty and Nia as foils, as opposite characters, even before their conflict at the end. You know, they, their opposition or their opposite qualities reveal something in each other. And we can always kind of understand one quality of the character better in relation to the other character. Moreover, their opposition is going to kind of play a role in how the story unfolds. Okay, so these are terms that I want you to think about on the discussion board post and as you read the story. Now let's jump into the story. We begin with a scene in which Nia, the narrator, is talking about her defense of her sister when her sister was sexually harassed by these patrons of their restaurant. And in some ways, this initial introduction should serve to tell us some things about Nia's characterization, right? She's, she's kind of impulsive. She's also brave, and she's very protective of her sister, even though Nia is the little sister. She also is told that she overreacted, but one thing we need to keep in mind is that the story sets the scene for us such that even an 11-year-old girl is keenly aware 
of the dangers of racism and sexism as they are intertwined in this moment in this particular small town in this restaurant. So the, the way in which this yet yeah, you know innocent moment of sexual harassment is something that Nia jumps at so which should suggest to us the kind of ominous nature of being an immigrant of being an Asian immigrant in a small town in which there aren't a lot of Asian immigrants and the way in which the exoticization of her sister and her sister's beauty is um, something that needs to be protected by by Mia right so this this opening yes is about showing us something about Mia, but it's also showing us something about the potential dangers of the context in which they are living in this town in South Dakota. We kind of gradually learn more about this family. This, the way the scene unfolds um, and the, in the restaurant not only gives us something about the characters, but also kind of tidbits about how Sorty and Mia have um, developed an intense bond because of their background. We don't actually get the details of that until much later in the story, but we do learn things that are sort of dropped in there, like on page 84, when we're told about how they you know, want to get grow up and travel over and work in Chinese restaurants. We're told that um, they'll go to California to see the stars, Paris, London, and then we're told Cambodia even, to light incense for the bones of our father. There are these juxtapositions in the story between the kind of typical flights of fancy of young American teenagers and then the intensity and very like particular backstory of the immigrant and refugee experience. In some ways, this is the thing that is going to bifurcate the relationship between Mia and Sorty and Mia and her mother. Nia is younger, significantly younger, and she doesn't remember what they went through in Cambodia. All she remembers is life in America. Whereas her sister and her mother are kind of bonded over the experience, uh, the trauma, really, of that experience as refugees in a war-torn country. Nia is only in relation to that, right? And she can only remember it through their eyes, through being told about it that should serve to kind of indicate that even though they are very close there's always kind of already this distance between them because they don't share the trauma in the same way it's also going to maybe help us understand why sorty and ma make certain decisions that nia can't really understand in some ways one could argue that sorty and ma are choosing a pretty traditional path for you know, Sorty to get married so young to this older man for the sake of stability, and that Nia completely rejects it because she is in some ways maybe like more Americanized, right? We see these kind of almost cliche um, be all you can be lines that she throws in there. You know, Your world is open to you, you can be anything, you can travel anywhere. These very kind of American tropes. At the same time, I would caution us from creating this neat you know, binary between traditional immigrant culture versus, or traditional Cambodian culture versus American culture. Because we need to remember that Ma is working multiple jobs, you know, raising these daughters on her own. This is not exactly an example of traditional Cambodian culture, right? It's an example of someone working really hard because they are struggling with poverty as a result of being a refugee. Likewise, you know, the decision to sort of marry off Sorty very young is all about finding financial stability for someone who might otherwise not have much of a future. So Sorty's practical choice and Ma's practical choice for Sorty are absolutely bound up in the economic conditions that they find themselves in the United States. They are not necessarily traditional Cambodian cultural expressions. So we need to keep this in mind. Anytime we think we know, you know what is American and what is Cambodian or immigrant versus American, we need to kind of trouble that and take a more complex approach to the story. There's a lot to delve in here. I don't want to overwhelm you with this video, so I will be interested to see what jumped out at you. you know, the story is very captivating because I think Mia is a very captivating character as a narrator, but she's also unreliable 
So one of the questions that the story raises, and it's entirely inconclusive, is whether Sordi is being abused by Mr. Chai. Nia thinks she is. Nia seems to jump to that conclusion, and she has some evidence for it. But on the other hand, we also know that Nia has a pretty limited point of view and a limited framework for understanding the kinds of complexities of Sordi's life as a married woman, as someone with a baby, etc. We also know that Nia is very possessive of her sister and wants any excuse to bring her back. So the unreliability of Nia makes it difficult for us to assess whether, in fact, Sordi was being abused. And in some ways, you know, what we get at the end, I think, is entirely unsatisfactory. I mean, we're told straight up, you know, at the very end of the story that she wasn't being abused. This is on page 95. After all this buildup, right, Duke and Nia driving in the snow down to her sister, they see that she has a black eye, Duke punches Mr. Chai, all of it, and then we just get this line, it turns out Sordi's husband hadn't beaten her up. An economy-sized box of baby wipes had fallen off the closet shelf and struck her full in the eye. That's it. That's all we get. So we have to decide, is that an excuse? Is it enough? You know, what do we make of this? Why do you think the author chose to keep it ambiguous? What does that do for you as a reader? There are a couple passages that I want us to look at carefully, uh, and I'm going to pull those up on the screen share now. The first, I think, is the most intense passage in the entire story, which up until this moment is fairly lighthearted. Um, the story, I mean, the tone of the story is fairly lighthearted until we get to this moment on page 92, 93. Duke and Nia are driving through the night to go save Sordi, and they are listening to the radio, and this Madonna song comes on. So a moment of intertextuality, right? This other text, the song comes on and is entered into the story here. I've given you the lyrics of Madonna's Lucky Star below. But I'm going to read this passage to you. Once upon a time, in another world, a place almost unimaginable to me, sitting in a pickup with Madonna singing Lucky Star on the radio, Sordi had walked across a minefield carrying me on her back. She was nine and I was four. Because she told me, I could see it all clearly, better than if I actually remembered. The startled faces of people who tripped a mine, their limbs in new arrangements, the bones peeking through the earth. Sordi had said it was safest to step on the bodies. That way you knew a mine was no longer there. This was nothing I would ever tell Duke. It was our personal story just for Sordi and me to share, nobody's business but ours. I would walk on bones for my sister, I vowed. I would put my bare feet on rotting flesh. I would save Sordi. So it's not till page 93 of a text that ends on page 95 that we come to fully understand the extent to which Nia feels beholden to her sister, that her sister saved her life and now she wants to save Sordi's life, wants to pay her back, if you will, because she carries a huge debt. Not only that, but a debt that she doesn't even remember. So the intergenerational trauma of the experience of being you know, a refugee from a war and torn country is something that Nia is working out and processing through her understanding of what is happening to Sordi and her attempt to rescue Sordi. I think it's also really important here that we see that this, this terrible story, right, this heartbreaking, really visceral description of what Sordi did for Nia is something that is also kind of central to their bond. It's described as our own personal story that they won't tell Duke in part because how would Duke ever understand this, right? He's just a small town guy from South Dakota. He, he's not going to be able perhaps to make a place for that in his understanding of who Sordi is. But it's also through this shared trauma that Sordi and Nia have created a world in which the two of them protect each other. 
this piece of information, this piece of backstory, also helps us understand why earlier we have a little vignette in which we're told Sorty and Duke and Mia go out to this field. Duke takes them out to this field and Sorty has essentially like a post-traumatic stress experience, right? She freaks out and runs through the field. We now see perhaps that she was having a, some kind of trigger perhaps to her experience walking through a minefield. And then I'm giving, as I said, I've given you Madonna's lucky star. You must be my lucky star because you make the darkness seem so far. And when I'm lost, you'll be my guide. I just turn around and you're by my side. Okay, so if you were writing about this story, this might be a good passage for you to select, to think carefully about, you know, the use of intertextuality, the use of this kind of moment of exposition in which this part, um, this memory helps kind of unlock other aspects of the characters stories and their relationships, but also the plot of the story as well. Finally, I want to look at a second passage, which is the ending. Now, we know they get there, we're told, it's already reports that everything's fine. So there's some tension in her marriage, but it's going to be okay and that she's not being beaten. And Mia asks her sister not to tell Ma that they had come down there. And we get this interesting moment in which Sordi indicates, or somehow, you know, the exchange between Sordi and Mia suggests that she's not going to keep her secret. And Mia says, I knew that I couldn't trust her to take my side anymore. As we pulled away from Sori's house, the first icy snowflakes began to fall across the windshield. Sori stood in the driveway with the baby on her hip. She waved to us as the snow swirled around her like ashes. She had made her choice and she hadn't chosen me. This image of the snow as ashes, you know, kind of functions in two ways. The, the shutting down of the, the closeness of the bond, the lack of trust, the fact that they won't keep secrets anymore suggests that Mia, you know, and her, her relationship to Sorority, something has died in it, in fact. Something has kind of frozen up, which we get from this symbol of the snowflakes, but also has died as though, it, you know, the symbol of the ashes um, kind of reflects that as well. She had made her choice, she hadn't chosen me. Is this just an inevitable sense of growing up? Is Mia too immature to really understand that it's okay that she wasn't chosen, that Sorty you know, wants to move on with her life? Or is it not just the choice of marriage? Is it a choice of a life that Mia doesn't relate to that is more the problem? You know, if Sorty had chosen a life that Mia aspired to, traveling the world, going to Paris, London, California, et cetera, then perhaps it would have felt like a, a different kind of inevitable growing up distancing of the relationship. We then get a, a quite a bit of space. So notice that, that at the end of the story, it comes to a close here, and then we get some space, and we get this sort of coda here at the end, in which Nia says, Sorty told me a story once about a magic serpent, the Naga, with a mouth so large it could swallow people whole. I have given you a picture of the Naga on Blackboard and a link to some information about the Naga if you're curious about this particular source of um, you know, mythology. Our ancestors carved Naga into the stones of Angkor Wat to scare away demons. Sorty said people used to believe they could come alive in times of great evil and protect the temples. They could eat armies. I wished I was a Naga I would have swallowed the whole world in one gulp. But I have no magic powers, none whatsoever. So I want to kind of ask you, you know, why, I'm going to end my screen share here, um, why the whole world? Why does Nia suddenly want to swallow the whole world? Why not just Mr. Chai? Why not Duke, right? Why not Ma? I think we can understand her desire to swallow the whole world here as a realization that the problem that she's facing, her kind of distancing from her sister, 
is much larger than just the fact that her sister married Mr. Chai. That the series of complications from their poverty to their limited options as, you know, an immigrant family forced to basically you know, operate a Chinese restaurant, even though they're not Chinese. Um, all of this is wrapped up in a world in which Mia sees that despite her very kind of American influenced idea of the world being your oyster, that things have shut down for her sister and they might shut down for her too. Her anger then is not directed at her sister. It's not even directed at Mr. Chai. It's at a situation Right, a kind of social, economic, family dynamic that makes certain choices seem less possible than others. Perhaps that's the kind of anger and resentment that she's expressing here at the end. And I wonder if we might make some connections between her character and her realization here with the character of Sammy at the end of AMP with his own realization about the world. So that might be something for you to reflect on and post about in your discussion board as well. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the story and I really look forward to reading your responses.